In 1954, the United States Supreme Court, in the landmark case Brown versus the Board of Education, held that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. Where desegregation was accepted and implemented, the strategy was successful. But in many parts of the country, it would take much more than a court order to change public opinion rooted in centuries of anti-black racism. Politicians in county and state governments across the South found ways to go around the laws. Sometimes they slashed state funding for public schools that integrated. Sometimes they supported private academies attended predominantly by white students. The main thrust behind African-American interests in desegregating was a desire for access to quality education. They understood that dollars followed white children into white schools. In American politics, the Southern strategy was the Republican Party's policy to gain political support in the South by appealing to the racism against African Americans harbored by many Southern white voters. As the civil rights movement and dismantling of Jim Crow laws in the 1950s and 1960s visibly deepened pre-existing racial tensions in much of the Southern United States, Republican politicians such as presidential candidate Richard Nixon and Senator Barry Goldwater developed strategies that successfully contributed to the political realignment of many white, conservative voters in the South to the Republican Party that had traditionally supported the Democratic Party. It also helped push the Republican Party much more right. Nearly 20 years after the Brown decision, many schools remained segregated, even in the North. And nowhere was this more evident than in Boston, Massachusetts. In response, the NAACP presented a class action suit demanding that schools and educational officials should act. In 1974, a federal judge in Massachusetts ruled that students in Boston would be bused from one neighborhood to another neighborhood to balance school systems racially. In South Boston, as many as 18,000 students were forced to attend new schools. Angry protesters carried signs, hurled bricks at buses, and blocked school entrances. Opposition to integration continued well after the initial violence subsided. Many middle-class white families moved to the suburbs, abandoning the city's public school system. The only explanation as to why we have gross immorality and such social perversion in the United States today is because Christians have retreated from their God-given responsibilities. They have not resisted Satan sufficiently. They have not consistently stood for biblical principles. They have surrendered self-government for welfare government. You see, government is the flow of power and force. When government is in the hands of godly men, it is good but in the hands of all others, it is evil. The real challenge to Christians in this country is, do we really want to save America? Do we want to prevent it being taken over by a godless atheist? Now, if that sounds extreme, so be it. But that is the challenge we face because the other side is working. And the question is, are we willing to work too? Bryant is a former Miss Oklahoma, a pop singer with three gold records to her credit. Until just lately, she's been identified with nothing more controversial than orange juice. Well, today she's at the center of a human rights controversy raging in Dade County, Florida, where earlier this year the county commission made it illegal to discriminate against homosexuals in hiring and in housing. She will use any form, the church pulpit, a letter writing campaign, or television talk shows. For several years, I've been praying for God to revive America. And when word came that, that there was an ordinance in Miami that, that would allow known homosexuals to teach my children, God help us as a nation to stand in these dark days. There are many evil things that would claim, under the disguise of discrimination and under civil rights, 
would claim the civil rights of our children just biologically that God made mothers so that we could reproduce. Homosexuals cannot reproduce biologically, but they have to reproduce by recruiting our children. Scientists at the National Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta today released the results of a study which shows that the lifestyle of some male homosexuals has triggered an epidemic of a rare form of cancer. While Reverend Falwell prepared to release his guidelines for curbing AIDS, homosexuals protested outside. Falwell claims too much emphasis has been put on finding a cure and not enough on preventing the spread of the disease from the gay community to heterosexuals. Homosexuality is a sin. It was California Republican William Dannemeyer who recently declared on the House floor God's plan for man was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Dannemeyer leads a group of conservative Republicans who hope to make AIDS a political issue. They meet to plan strategy for bringing controversial AIDS-related legislation to the House floor. We want to identify every person who's a carrier. We want to identify every possible way to stop them from, from spreading the disease. And we want to be open and honest about this disease before it becomes a really serious national health threat. Until the Reagan administration realizes that the government's responsibility is saving lives and not saving souls, we will continue to see the virus spread through our society. Steve owns a gym in Houston, but if Proposition 1 passes, Steve will be forced to open the women's locker room to anyone who claims a female identity. If Steve says yes, he'll lose customers. And if he says no, he will be breaking the law and could be fined thousands of dollars. Houston is already a tolerant city. Vote no on Houston Prop 1. Protect freedom and preserve safety. Um, I'd like to start with some scenarios first, uh, and you've heard one of them already. A 17-year-old boy has the penis of a 9-year-old. How does that happen? Girls in the United States as young as 13 and 14 years old are having mastectomies of completely healthy breasts. Why is this happening? NIH-funded research is examining the effects of, of, of kids as young as age 8 receiving injections for gender transition. Who is allowing this? Step back, uh, talk about some definitions. What is gender dysphoria? It's a mismatch between a person's physical sex and their mind's perception of that sex. And this is a real condition, and, and these kids, of course, deserve all the care and attention and love in the world. But we're concerned about medicalization. Most of these kids, uh, as Ryan said, will, will actually grow out of this condition either through watching and waiting or help from a therapist or psychologist. There's a newer phenomenon of uh, adolescents, uh, particularly uh, teenage girls and some boys who are suddenly developing this condition. Uh, Dr. Lisa Littman did an excellent uh, publication about this. this. What is all this predicated on? Something called uh, gender identity. Uh, and this was defined in a court case uh, as a person's core internal sense of their own gender. What's interesting I found in this case is they said that this gender identity is the primary factor in determining a person's sex. This is an ongoing case, and not biology. That's incorrect. How about this? How about for the 
so-called transgender child, the, the gender identity, can you find it in a blood test? Can you do uh, testings of genetics? Or can you do a brain image and find the gender identity in there? You cannot. There is no objective test to diagnose this. Yet, we're giving very harmful therapies on the basis of no objective diagnosis. There are only two sexes. Uh, certain science publications are, want to make you think there's more or that it's a spectrum. What governs this whole system is the endocrine system. Uh, there's a small gland that's at the top there called the pituitary gland, hangs off the brain, produces hormones, signaling hormones. Uh, you can see LH, FSH. These act on the gonads. So in the male, LH will act on uh, the testicle to produce testosterone. You can see illustrated there. And in the female, LH will act on the ovaries to make estrogen. And it's these hormones which take the person through the stages of development and then are available in adulthood. Now, there are medical conditions where this process is interrupted. We call it hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. This is something an endocrinologist uh, would diagnose and treat. Um, there are also hormones which can cause, uh, cause this to happen. Uh, medications like Lupron you may have heard of. What about using this medication for stopping normal puberty, say at 12 or 8? This is an off-label, untested, experimental use. It hasn't been through any FDA approval process. It's what, what I would call a chemical conversion therapy. Uh, eight or nine years old, third or fourth grade, and think of what you were doing at, or your kids at age eight, maybe building a snowman, maybe talking to snowmen, uh, maybe thinking you were a cat or a fairy, something like that. Do, do we really know that the girl thinks he's a boy? Is, is really that the case? So what's the bottom line on this uh, child-adolescent affirmative therapy? We, we don't know long-term outcomes. I've told you already some short-term problems, uh, but it hasn't been tested from childhood forward. This whole thing is an experiment on children. We're ignoring the voices of the sisters and, and people who have, who have come out of this and recognize their, their sex. And the NIH is allowing unethical research to be conducted on children and adolescents, in my opinion.